first state to allow voting rights for women. And then guess what happened in the other states? Hey, they, they followed. They, they, that state allowed women to have the right to vote, and if the state didn't implode, it's okay. We'll give the right to vote. And what happened, politician after politician, came to tell people what they already believed to know to be true. Why? Because there was public demand that they tapped into. Don't wait for the politicians. Here's a famous saying from Mark Twain. I'll let you read it. Famous quote from Mark Twain. If we rely on these people to fix health care, they're going to miss it. Why? Because they are fundamentally disconnected from the front lines of American medicine. They're fundamentally disconnected. What is the underlying problem in healthcare when somebody says, I heard about Obamacare, Obamacare repeal, Obamacare replace? What's your thought? What's your opinion? You know, you know what I tell them? We need to stop talking about different ways to pay for the broken healthcare system and start talking about ways to fix the broken healthcare system. There is a best way to pay for healthcare. I'm, I'm sure of that. You know what? The underlying problem that's not on anyone's radar is variation. Variation. The variation I saw as a student, the variation I saw in the endoscopy suite, guess how much money that cost when that guy had surgery for the polyp removal? Who paid for it? Who paid for that operation? Colon resection, about $25,000. Who paid for that? All of you did. All your patients did. Patients come in and they say, I'm supposed to have a CAT scan. I don't know if I can afford it. How much does it cost? We've never had those questions before. They're paying for the unnecessary care. They're paying for the problem of variation. When the Golden State Warriors coach two weeks ago missed two of the playoff games because of back surgery and a complication, and he goes on record saying, I should have never had the back surgery. If you're ever told you need back surgery just for chronic pain, do rehab, rehab, rehab. Don't let anyone in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I calculated two back operations in an article that should be out on CNN.com later this week. Two back operations, a CSF uh, fluid leak. I'm estimating that with his ICU days in total state, about $250,000. Who paid for that? People are angry about their health insurance premiums. They should be angry about variation. They should be angry about quality at the bedside. They should be angry about not fixing our broken health care system. When uh, a patient tells you, I can't afford my health insurance anymore. When a business leader tells you, I got results on all my contractors except for one, health insurance, so you keep throwing money into it, it goes up every year, and this is what the politicians will tell you. They'll tell you that they're on the brink of lowering health care costs. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Health care inflation's gone up 5 to 10% every year since the 80s. If you remember, people have been outraged for a long time. And then you add three expensive insurance benefits. Uh, keeping kids on your parents' plan until you're 26 getting rid of pre-existing conditions, and getting rid of lifetime tax. I believe in those. All Republicans believe in those. All Democrats believe in those. Every member of Congress believes in those. Everyone wants to keep those three provisions. Well, guess what? They're not free. They're expensive insurance benefits. And you add that to the rising cost of health inflation every year, which is a steady 5 to 10%, what you have are crushing premiums. That's detracting from the growth and wealth in almost, almost every year. America. Now, let me show you something. Most common presentation of surgeon sees appendicitis. Three articles out in the top medical journals in the last year and a half showing you don't need to do surgery for appendicitis. Antibiotics cures 80% of non perforated appendicitis. I was on call the other night at one of the community hospitals, a patient came in with appendicitis. Get away the next day for his sister, and I thought, gosh, what do I do? Do I do the operation right now and see hopefully he heals in time, advance at the wedding, or do I give him the antibiotics? And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go with the science, give him the option, show him the study, and what I found is that when you're honest with people, there's a 
tremendous appreciation for the honesty. He gave him the option. Well, guess what he chose? Surgery, surgery or no surgery? Guess. Take a guess. <laughs> no surgery. What? Next day, is feeling fine. I feel fine. Can I get out of here? The next patient came in and gave antibiotics for appendicitis. Statistically, about 30 people in this room have had their appendix removed. Next uh, time, the next patient came in with us, gave me antibiotics. Next day, Doc, when can I go out of here? The food stinks. I want to go home. Want to... The next morning, patient after patient, six, the last six patients came in, gave me antibiotics, no surgery. If we just did what was best for patients, we would eliminate the problems in healthcare overnight.
think the politicians are aware of that problem? We need to focus not just on the technical skills, but on the non-technical skills of delivering great care. There's a famous quote from Teddy Roosevelt describing the members of Congress. I'll let you know. <laughs> but there was one great politician from Ohio. Anyone here from Ohio? Hey. Hey. You would know why he was the most popular president ever at the time of an election. People love folks from the Midwest and Ohio in particular. Yeah, Williams College, he was um, on his way to attend the commencement exercises of Williams College. Two months into his presidency, he had very progressive ideas. He believed women should have the right to vote and hold a prominent role in American society. He appointed women to high positions. He believed black people in America should have a prominent role, the right to vote in prominent roles in society, even in his own administration. He was four presidents after Lincoln. Many very, very advanced ideas got um, progressed during his short two months in pre as president. But all of these ideas came to a halt when a crazy guy shot him on 7th and E downtown here in Washington, D.C. A man named Charles Gateau with mental health illness shot him at a railroad station. They quickly arrested Gateau, took the president to an infirmary, and later to the White House for two months. Doctors formed at his bedside. One doctor said, we need to do an operation to remove the bullet, Dr. Bliss. So we need to do an operation. The other doctor said, look, we have civil war experience. Listen to us when we tell you from the bedside, from the bottom of our heart, you are more likely to harm the patient in the process of trying to take out the bullet. Let him be. We have clinical experience. Well, Dr. Bliss, who was a politician, fired the other doctors for the civil war experience began seven operations over the two months with his bare hands and dirty instruments and assistance. He also did labor delivery <laughs> on other patients. Appointed himself the head doctor for the president because he said he had the credential that he had been the doctor for Lincoln when Lincoln was shot at Ford's Theater because he was nearby. Which, if you know how that went down, <laughs> Lincoln's body. Lincoln's bodyguard was a known alcoholic hung out on a, in a pub across from Ford's Theater. Actually, you can go there today. It's not a bad pub. It's still there. Garfield, poor guy, was told he needed to be NPO except for an oatmeal, the one food he went on record saying he ate it before he was shot. The doctors did all these crazy things, enemas, operations. The president died of a psoas muscle abscess nowhere near the bullet. Alexander Graham Bell, one of the many Americans who grew fond of the president, invented a metal detector to help the doctors localize the bullet. He put it on one side of the president. The metal detector did not alarm. He said, now let me put it on the other side. And the doctor said, no, you, we're done. We know it's on that side. It turns out the bullet traversed the other side. The president died of too much medical care. The president died of a lack of clinical wisdom. President died, I would submit to you, from a lack of humility. Same reason a patient I watched as an intern got an open colectomy operation instead of a polypectomy in the endoscopy suite. Why did that patient get that? A lack of humility by the doctor taking care of the patient. I would submit to you the president died of variation. The costly endemic cancer that plagues our very tremendous healthcare system. Dr. Bliss submitted a bill for half a million dollars to the government for services. The government, frustrated, didn't know what to do, so they offered him 6,000 bucks. Probably an early sign of Medicare. He was, the doc was insulted. The doc was insulted at the $6,000 counter offer, refused to take the money, and went on to trash, trash the government. The, the assassin, by the way, with mental illness, said on his witness stand, I only shot the I only shot the president. The doctor was the one that killed him. <laughs> Five years prior, Dr. Lister had presented solid evidence. You've heard this dream. Dr. Lister presented solid evidence that the use of hand washing and an alcohol-based solution 
lowered the mortality from any procedure on the human body from 50% to one in seven people dying. If ever there was a birth of medical procedures, this might have been at five years before the president was shot. But the doctors at the time said they don't believe the data, and after all, you can't trust it because it's from Europe. <laughs> a lack of humility. Our healthcare system needs humility. We need humility from our policymakers. We need humility from our hospital administrators. And that means they need to come down to the bedside and watch us taking care of patients. Side study. 
not yet published, but I wrote about it, and unaccountable. At age two, people just want to not pee their pants. At age 10, people just want to make friends. At age 20, people want to be romantic. At age 30, people just want to make money. At age 40, they just want to make money. At age 50, they want to be romantic again. <laughs> At age 70, they just want to make friends again. And by age 90, they just want to not pee their pants. Now, other, the food industry put out a myth that 
People aren't obese because they're lazy. People were lazy before 1960. <laughs> <laughs> but something happened with the AHA low-fat recommendation that perfectly parallels the obesity curves in the United States. When we went to low-fat, the proportion of low-fat foods in the market corresponded with the amount of carbohydrates and obesity grew. And we look at these kids with diseases we've never seen before. Type 2 diabetes at age 4 years old. Is that because the kid is lazy? No. Because of the food that we, as a healthcare profession, told people they should eat. I'm a pancreas surgeon. I can tell you that when you eat carbohydrates, your insulin levels spike. When you eat low carb and complex carbohydrates, naturally occurring sugars like things down to fiber and fruits, you have a normal basal slow change in your insulin level with the red curve. The body was never meant to be pounded. The pancreas was never meant to be pounded with carbohydrates like we have told people for the last 50 years to eat. How about this problem, the man-made problem of people dying not from the disease or illness that brings them to care, but from the care that they receive. Now, I've tried hard to change the lexicon in healthcare, and I've taken some heat for it. But like I said, I don't care. They can have me. But the patients don't care about a 2% risk of an asthmatic leak after surgery. What they care about is when can I mow the lawn again. The patients don't care about a readmission rate that's 3% higher at one center than the other. They care about when can I hold my granddaughter again. That's what matters to patients. And if we put the patients at the center, you will see a whole rebranding of healthcare in a way we've never talked about it before. Can we call things what they are? Instead of a cost to charge ratio that we talked about in academic health policy, can we talk about price gouging for patients? Markup? predatory medical care? Yeah. You walk in, what supermarket do you put an orange down there and they, they say, there's no price on the orange and they ring it up and they say, oh, it's $5,000 for the orange. And you say, oh, well, in that case, I don't want it. No, too late. When you see the price, you can't go back. What market works like that? <laughs> only health care. Only health care. Why? Because a lot of stakeholders are making a lot of money off the system. We need to put the patients at the center, not the business. Center. Number one cause of death in the United States, heart disease. Number two, cancer. How did we get these um, numbers? These are our country's national health statistics put out by the CDC every year. CDC gets their statistics from the states that collect death certificates. I can tell you when you fill out a death certificate and ask you what was the primary and immediate cause of death, sometimes you just use your best judgment. Now, what if somebody dies because of a communication breakdown? What if someone dies because of a lack of humility by the person taking care of them? What if the person dies because the nurse ratio was so ridiculous they couldn't get the attention that they deserved? What do you put on a death certificate? So when somebody goes into cardiac arrest, you do CPR, you call a code, fill out the death certificate, what do you write? Cardio, heart, heart disease, cardiovascular arrest. It turns out that I pointed out in the article in the BMJ that we collect our national health statistics using billing codes. People don't just die from billing codes. <laughs> when you calculate the real cause of death, it turns out if you pull all the medical literature, the number, the number of people that die from medical mistakes is about 251,000. Where does that fall on the list? Okay. Even if you use the old number from the 1999 Institute Medicine Report, which is actually based on data from 1984, we just said, hey, can we update the number? It's like half a century now. 100,000, even if you believe that, that puts it at five. You take your pick, but we have to start calling it what it is. People not dying from the illness or disease that brings them to care, but from the care that they receive. 
I call it medical care done wrong because that's what the patients call it as. We can call it preventable adverse events and wash ourselves clean of any responsibility, but I call it what it is, and that is medical care gone wrong. This study gen generated a tremendous amount of, of uh, media. Of course, what's tricky with the media is they tend to sensationalize sensitive topics that are difficult for people to appreciate. It's not a matter of getting out the bad doctors and nurses out of the system. It's a more complex problem burnout and where we are with the problem of variation. Now, Margaret Mead once had this quote, never underestimate the power of a few individuals to change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I want you to think about this tomorrow. When there was only BlackBerry and a few other competitors, and everybody said, we can't change the cell phone market. Why, these people are here forever to stay. Never underestimate the power of a few individuals to change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever happens. sales today, in the last year, which measured 231 million, that's almost the number of people in America. Do you even see Blackberries anymore? <laughs> Samsung gets like free advertising in airplanes now when you get on board. <laughs> you know, Samsung get off, it could explode. I mean, Apple <laughs> dominates. Why? Because of a few individuals. Because of a culture at Apple that focuses on the user, just like we need to focus on the patient. I can't tell you the amount of emails I get um, on things that don't matter, okay? This is my inbox, and never mind, it says 58,479. <laughs> I'm going to clean that out this weekend. <laughs> but if we can talk to each other with respect, people will say the most demanding, rude things on email, they would never dare call you and come over and talk to you face to face and tell you or ask you that for the same things by email. Why? Because email has the anonymity of don't know who each other it is. It promotes bad culture and disruptive behavior. And that's why when we created the surgery checklist and published the first ever surgery checklist, we wanted the first question to say, what are the names and roles of the members of this team? Why? To activate them so they know they are an important safety net by speaking up, no matter what the thought or concern is, good or bad. We want to empower people to speak up. To get rid of the anonymity that limits our ability to take care of patients. That's humility. It's humility. We fought hard to keep that, and to, that, to this day, that is still the number one item on the checklist, on every checklist in every operating room around the world. What are the names and uh, roles of the members of the team? Sebastian Thrun, a professor at Stanford University, most popular prof engineering professor in the entire school, decided to do something radical. Never underestimate the power of one person to change the world and it's the only thing Sebastian Thrun decided to offer his class, the most popular class at Stanford, available to all students, not just at Stanford, but around the world, for free, if they completed the module and completed the test and could go to the next level. 161,000 students from around the world signed up for the class. The top student at Stanford finished 411th <laughs> in the class. Sebastian Thrun is now talking about lowering the price of college by 90% over the next 10 years. That's a fresh new idea. Never underestimate the power of a few individuals to change the world. When there was only a group of car companies that controlled the market and no one could ever break in, when a time when no one found it to be a good experience to go and buy a car from the dealership, you go and you play by their games and their sticker price is not the real price and I don't know anyone that loves going to buy 
the car in the dealership. But never underestimate the power of a few individuals to change the world. On July 14, 2016, John Neely told his Tesla self-driving car and the autopilot feature, I think I'm having a heart attack, please take me to the closest emergency room. The car in the autopilot feature self-drove him with standard software now in every Tesla vehicle on the streets to a uh, close nearby emergency room where he was treated for chest pain. Tesla just announced their $35,000 car. Drives over 300 miles on a single charge from your regular um, outlet. They got, they took pre-orders for $1,000. This is the only picture they've ever released. 500,000 Americans bought the car, putting their own money down for pre-order. Now, where else in the auto industry do you see people buying a car they've never seen. <laughs> and do you see people waiting outside in long lines outside of dealerships <laughs> to buy a car they've never seen before? I don't. Never underestimate the power of a few individuals to change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. People ask me all the time, how do you know you're getting good quality care? And I tell them, ask the nurses. come down to see their patients when there's a problem. They know which ones have complications. They know which ones take twice as long to do the same operation. They know everything about healthcare. All you need to do is ask them. And in a network of rock star doctors and physical therapists that we've put together around the country, we've created this network. As I've become um, deep in the space of quality, I've decided I want to reward the doctors with humility. And I want to reward the doctors that do the right thing and don't over-operate and do the wrong thing, like knee replacements when the patients don't need it, and appendectomy when the patients get antibiotics. I want to reward the good doctors out there. There's a lot of them. So I decided to create my own network of doctors. So people can have access to the network, employers can have access to the network, because they're disrupting healthcare right now. But guess how I take the doctors in the network? I ask the nurses who is the most ethical and doctor you ever worked with. And that is the Visa Healthcare Network. Corey uh, is running it. She's doing a tremendous job. She's from Montana. Anyone here from Montana? <laughs> That's a long flight. We're doing the same thing with um, health systems. Let us run our measures of appropriateness and we will tell you who does way too many things and way too infrequent things. We need to get at appropriateness in medical care. Debbie Shetty disrupted health care when he decided he's going to offer one set price for his cabbage procedure. Standard coronary artery bypass surgery at his hospital that he owns and runs costs about 500 US dollars. But he's in India. I don't know about going to India, but what about his outcomes? Well, his outcomes are the same as that of the, of the Cleveland Clinic. So impressive, he got written up in the Harvard Business Review, a big article. Debbie Shetty, I co-keynoted co with him at a conference, and I asked him, I said, how are you doing these procedures for $500? And he said, you know, Marty, if you just listen to people who take care of patients, they will tell you how to do it right. We can do it the way we want to do it here at my hospital. Patients heal better with fresh air and sunlight than they do with gauze and air conditioning. If you look at the whole patient and take care of their families and empower them to do some of the bedside care along with the nurses, you realize they don't need to be in the hospital as long as they do. Debbie Shetty is disrupting health care. The surgery center in Oklahoma City, anyone here from Oklahoma? Oklahoma City is disrupting health care. Why? Because they have a place where they're publishing the prices of their operations and they guess who hates this? The insurance companies are going nuts. You can't do that. Why? Because they see the writing on the wall. If this happens and goes well, and it is, 
Why do we need insurance? Why do we need insurance? Employers are paying for your health care. Why are they paying the third person? They can pay for the care directly. And that's what 40% of US employers now are moving into self funded insurance. Why? Because it makes sense. It cuts out the middleman and it cuts out the waste. Why do we have networks? Oh, you're in network. Oh, you're out of network. Oh, you got to pay more because Why do we have networks? We need to get back to straight, old fashioned bedside medical. Care. It's never perfect, but you know what? The United States was never perfect. When it formed, many say this painting captured not only the state of health care in America, but the state of the United States as a society. Crude, dark, primitive, the surgeon looking away, his head above those of his assistants at the operating uh, table. The students in the background not even paying attention. The mother in the corner of the room looking away in horror. Why? Because no evidence was used. There was no science. There was no ether. They were doing a debridement of an osteomyelitis, incredibly painful. That's what he was capturing. Aikens, the painter, was capturing the pain in American medicine and American society because of its darkness. And what many believe to be the greatest juxtaposition of American paintings in oil was his subsequent painting 14 years later, where he would define what would make American medicine great. A nurse prominent at the bedside. At the same height, at the same head level as that of the surgeon. A light shining on the entire operative team, showing the role of teamwork. Students in the background learning, showing how hospitals were now learning from their mistakes. And the patient under control anesthesia, showing the role of science with ether and sterile technique being implemented. Why? Because science and save American medicine if we just listen to those at the front lines of medicine. I, this is one of my favorite paintings, and I think the story of it is the story of American transparency and teamwork in medicine. So the next time somebody tells you, how do you think we're going to fix our health care system? And they get all, you know, into all the demagogues subjects, right? Don't be careful with the media, by the way. They'll focus on what polarizes us. Tremendous consensus in America around a lot of things the media will not talk about. What percent of Americans are against the issue of corruption? <laughs> That's the number one issue. 100%. We, we are united. Do not let the media and the politicians polarize us over a demagogue subject. I had a patient the other day try to tip me 20 bucks and I'm like, what's this? And he said, here, I know you're getting screwed by Obamacare right now. <laughs> <laughs> the next time somebody asks you, the next time somebody asks you, how do you think we need to fix health care in America? You can tell them we need to just get back to our great American heritage of teamwork in the operating room. With that, I want to say I'd love to stay in touch. If you're interested in these issues and stories, they're all described in uh, my book, Unaccountable. These are my contact information here. I love you guys. I love what you're doing. Unfortunately, I have to run out of a meeting with uh, Tom Price, the Secretary of Health and Human Services at 330. <laughs> I won't come to reception. I didn't want to meet everyone here. I haven't met so far. So thank you so much for having me. Good luck.